Thank you, Professor Stark, the second comment on today. It is a great pleasure and honor for Dr. Professor Yushenko from NYU, who is going to speak about the Ecovarian Biological Challenge. Well, I'm very honored to be here. It's a great pleasure to participate, to contribute to the celebration of Professor Yao. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, joint work with uh, Kocevic and more recent work with uh, Stone. So let me start with uh, simple things. Uh, Yes. Okay. This chaotic integration. <coughs> so we're looking at the FI line, we look at the chaotic points, there is a function, the height function, which is uh, maximum one, chaotic absolute value of the coordinate. And then we look at uh, subsets of the chaotics given by let's say, the chaotic absolute value less than equal to one. These are the chaotic integers that we normalize the volume so that the volume is one. And then we look at the slices where the periodic value is p to the j, the volume is this, and then we want to integrate, sorry, something so that it's Okay, so uh, then we integrate, and uh, uh, so it's uh, the sum for all the values, p to the j, and then volume times this. And then the leading constant here, uh, so it's geometric series that we can sum. This is what comes out. And then we are interested in uh, the special value. So let's uh, if you go to some beautiful screen, yeah. it's uh, maybe a Okay, so and then we put s equals 2, and I'll explain to you what the 2 means. And you see 1 minus 1 over p squared divided by 1 minus 1 over p, so it's 1 plus 1 over p, and so this is p plus 1 over p. You can interpret this as the number of points on P1 over a finite field divided by P to the 1, which is the dimension of P1. So what's the moral? We're integrating over the open part of the A1 in P1, but we're finding information concerning the, the closure. So we'll interpret this later as a volume with respect to some <coughs> measures. So please switch back again the definition of H. This is H, H, P, maximum one absolute value. Okay, so now let's do the toric varieties thing. So uh, we have a lattice N, so do lattice M, and you have a collection of cones in N that there are. So uh, let the one N is one dimensional cones. And so the most important thing here is the exact sequence uh, m going to something called p size linear functions on the fan, and that goes into the Picard group of x. Okay. So what does it all mean? The uh, one-dimensional cones correspond to dividers in, uh, let's say, smooth projected from multiplication of the torus, the torus in this case, gm to the d, and uh, you take any divider you use the torus section to push it to the boundary, so every divisor is equivalent to uh, a sum with integral coefficients of boundary components. And the way you encode these integral coefficients is in these piecewise linear things, because <coughs> what is a piecewise linear function on the fan? Well, it's defined by its values from the one-dimensional generators. So you just prescribe complex values, okay? Not necessarily integer values. And, well, let's keep it in our head. Now, what you should also know is that if you take the periodic points of the torus and divide by the integer, the periodic integral points of the torus, that is n. So there is this logarithm map. And, uh, okay, now what is the local height? The analog of we just did for p1. Well, we take the p, that's the prime, and then raise it to the power piecewise linear function 
on the fan evaluated in the image of the point under this logarithmic map into n co characters of the point. Okay? So, and now we are integrating from the periodic points this function that now depends on n complex variables as one as two as n, a complex variable for each of the uh, boundary dividers. And uh, the answer is a sum plus minus uh, of uh, what? So you've got a sum over subcones in the fan, and in each of the subcones, we have essentially a product of geometric series. <laughs> and so what we're going to see here is like a product of geometric series. So here is a product over all one dimensional generators of that cone. The fan, and then minus one to the k k the four dimension of the cone, and then that's the answer. So I missed, uh, I missed what phi s is. So it's a piecewise linear function, phi s, which is defined by its values on one dimensional generators. So it's piecewise linear because it's linear on every cone. So let's look at the picture. Our favorite picture. Uh, this is P two. So if you take g m q p square module the integers, we map it to this lattice, I see these lattice points. And now we have a function that on each generator, here for example, it's a like S1. So the function on this cone is going to be a linear function, say on this cone, which is simply P to the power S1 of the corresponding lattice point. So if you just restrict to here, then it's really very, very similar to what we had for P1. It's exactly the same as we had for P1. So now if you want to integrate, you're just summing over lattice points in each of the uh, cones. And of course, well, it's a product of geometric series. So, so that's the formula that's written here. If you untangle this formula similar to before, what you find that this is for special values, namely if you put all the sj equal to one, you find exactly the number of q points <coughs> of the uh, toric variety over uh, well, p to the dimension. And how do we know that? Well, each of the terms here is essentially the number of p points of the stratum corresponding to the uh, one dimensional strata are dividers, the two dimensional, two dimensional points correspond to the sections of dividers, and they're all toric. And so we're finding for each of the toric, we're finding essentially p minus one. Okay? So that's the picture. Now let's keep this. So I uh, ran into this in my joint work with Victor Patrick on I'm thinking arithmetic geometry, distribution of rational points of bounded height, of toric varieties. And in the proof, we had to study periodic integrals of this type. So essentially, you look at a generating series for rational points of bounded height, then you realize that the heights are the points of the adels. You realize that you have a function of L2 of T of the adels divided by T, an automorphic function. You decompose the characters, and uh, these kind of integrals show up when you analyze place by place the Euler products, Fourier transforms of the height function. Okay, now. Uh, so then, a couple of years later, uh, completely independently, Borisov and Ganos discovered that if you take essentially the same formula that we had before in the local height integral on a toric variety, and you write this kind of an expression, then it becomes a modular form for gamma 1p. Okay? Under the assumption that now the uh, piecewise linear function on the uh, generators of one dimensional cones takes values in one over p times p. So for us, in our business, we look at complexified piecewise functions. So here's a look at this, this situation. And moreover, in fact, as you go over different complexifications, different tor toric varieties, you actually find all modular forms for gamma 1 p. Okay? So that's kind of beautiful that uh, you have a supply 
of such things, and in particular, of course, the hack operators. And how do you define hack operators? Well, you see these local uh, Fourier, Fourier transforms, the local height integrals, it's a sum over lattice. So whenever you have sums over lattices, you can look at sub lattices, under lattices, average over you know, over lattices of some fixed index. And so that's how you get hack operators into the picture. Let's forget this for a while, come back to this later. So now we're looking at just arbitrary smooth projective varieties over number field. Uh, we're interested in rational points, and we study them via matrice, the delta matrice, very line bundles, which you can think of as uh, fixing the projective embedding, and some more embedding. It's the same for different places, and there is some choice of all the associated type. So, in this situation, if you have a smooth projective final variety, uh, Emmanuel Pair defined something that generalized uh, the Magaba measures well known in the theory of linear algebraic groups. So Dale has a book on the Magaba measures, the Magaba numbers of linear algebraic groups. But it turned out that you can have that in complete generality once you've matrized the economical or the canonical line bundle. And the final condition is needed not for the local construction that I'm describing here, but for the regularization of the adelic integral. So for all practical purposes, forget the final thing over there. Just start with a full projective algebraic variety. It's the any points, and then we try the canonical line bundle. So then look at local analytic coordinates. Okay. Now you look at uh, a section of canonical line bundle, so here is a section of the canonical line bundle locally. And because your canonical line bundle is matrice, you know its length, its norm. So that's some kind of function here. Okay, you multiply this number by this is now uh, the power measure, which you normalize appropriately. And then uh, it turned out that this thing that's defined local analytically, you can do it over the real complex numbers, periodics, it doesn't matter. It's just an analytic definition. That is to change charts, go from one chart to another, things blue as they should, and that's going to be a measure. On the periodic <coughs> or complex or real points of the variety. So, uh, let's integrate once we have a measure. So it turns out that if you integrate over the periodic points, of any that is Q open, it's the same as integrating over the Gary points of the whole projective variety. So essentially, it's because an integral over an open integral uh, interval is the same thing as an integral over closed interval if there are no singularities. So this measure has no singularities. So okay, it is the same. Now uh, the Gary points, however projective variety, it's the same thing as the integers. So now the integers you can project onto the reductions. So now you're reducing your sum over all the points here, and then you look at the kind of pre-image, and the pre-image again is stratified again as geometric series, they're all the same, and the answer is for each point in the pre-image you find one over q to the dimension, and then you're summing over all the points, and you get number of a few points over Q to the dimension. And now you also see why you need the final condition, if there is no H1, we're using bail conjectures here, then you can regularize by H2, which is Picard, Picard lattice, and then it just works better. But, so this is the answer. Now, so these numbers that pair introduced uh, in connection with minus conjecture, you see, when you're doing the height zeta function method with Adels, the answer was a sum over all characters, da 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 da, but each of the integrals was an integral over the Adelic points of the torus. But minus conjecture predicts that the leading term in the asymptotic formula for rational points is an integral over the periodic points of the compactification. And so, as we are comparing these measures, uh, Victor Butterick realized that you can apply this to prove this theorem 
about collabing algorithms. Suppose you have birational collabing algorithms. So the canonical bundle is trivial, and therefore it's the constants, and therefore there is a canonical metronization on that bundle. Now we've learned that if we take a metrized canonical line bundle and produce the Magava measure integrate, we get the number of q points over q to the dimension for all q. And so then, if you have birational collabing else, on some the risk you open the just isomorphic. And so you integrate over the dyadic points. It's the same thing as integrating over the dyadic points of the open. This is the same thing as this, and this is this. So, well, if you have it for all Q, the male conjectures tell you birational collabing else that you could get it. And in fact, this became also the origin of what's now known as Motivic integration, introduced by Maxine, who immediately realized that the adic numbers is relevant. We just look at the Laurent power series and do the same thing. And, uh, well, it's a big field. There's connections. Uh, it's Lozère, Prochowski, I mean, many people supplied all the forms. It's kind of a great thing. But I just wanted to let you know how these things evolved. Sorry, sorry. Now, uh, so what are we learning? What have, yes. Sorry, so silly question. You, you don't have that birational phonos have equal Betty numbers. No. Because it's difficult to because make the memorization. is not canonical. Yes, right. So, That's the point. The main point here is that canonical metrization of the canonical line. That's the key point. Okay. So, but the metrization always exists? Is that if you obvious? can match the matrix, okay. then you get a similar state. But in reality, this is this is why it works. That's really now. So, but what have you learned? With what have I learned from all of our things? So, when you do an analytic number theory, circle method or whatever, you get some leading constants. Now, computing these constants is actually a huge headache. If you've ever seen an analytic number series that tell you the leading constant is a product of local densities, for almost all places, the local density is this. But then, oh, what happens in places of bad reduction? Now, computing explicitly the contribution of places of bad reduction, it's a huge nightmare, which involves the resolution of singularities, da, 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 explicitly. Even computing these things as the reals is a headache, because what you get is, I mean, what are these things from the reals? So here's your variety. You look at the epsilon uh, neighborhood, cube, neighborhood of your variety. You compute the volume, right? You let epsilon go to zero, and you look at the leading term. And that's the thing that comes into, that's a singular integral in the circle, classical circle mass. But what we've learned playing this game is that you never want to compute these constants. You only want to match the measures, which is much easier, okay? Because the computation of the constants uh, is hard. Now, measures, however, just match them. All right. So this is some recent, relatively recent work by Santon Chamberlain. Uh, you put the integrals, complete generality. Again, uh, let's do local theory first. We have a smooth projected variety x as a risk of a new, and the boundary, which is a uh, rig normal cross x divider. And, uh, well, anyway. So we introduce the stratification of the boundary, intersection of components, and then open pieces. Okay. Uh, so uh, each such thing is smooth, so some of what I mentioned. Now we have local heights. So local heights, I want to you know, make it very, very easy. Essentially, this is a periodic distance to the boundary component the alpha. This is how you should think of that. So we have a boundary certification, something like this, boundary, and then you fall somehow into one of the stratum, the reduction mode P, and once you're there, okay, you're just measuring periodically how close you are to the boundary. Right, becoming more explicit in a second. And the kind of integrals you want to understand is product of these local heights, to the power minus s alpha, s alpha is a complex number. And then the integrating over the open. Okay? Now, so what do we do? It's an analytic manifold. 
we introduced local analytic charts where we have local analytic coordinates giving us the distance to the boundary. And the local analytic coordinate is simply x, that's the coordinate, to the power well as alpha. But now, since we're changing charts, you have to multiply with the kind of absolute value of the Jacobian, right? So therefore, there is kind of a shift by rho alpha. The rho alpha are the uh, uh, coefficients of the anti-canonical, OK? in this presentation. So forget the shift for a second. This integral is essentially a product of the integrals from before. All right? And these are geometric series, as you know, that we've computed. And so what's the answer? The answer is that, for almost all places, you get a formula, which is the number of few points of the boundary stratum, again over q to the dimension. But now, it's this geometric series that we're summing. All right. So let's specialize as before to a particular S alpha. Let's put all the S alpha equal to rho alpha. In other words, we're looking at S defining kind of the anti-canonical line bundle. So if you put S alpha equal to rho alpha, you're seeing Q plus 1 minus 1 and Q minus 1. That cancels. So what's left? If there is no term here, you're just finding sum of rho strata. If q points in the strata or q to the dimension, well, that of course collapses to if q points over q to the dimension uh, for uh, right. In other words, this Ibuta type integral is a refinement of what we've seen before and uh, uh, of Taylor's construction. And uh, I, I would like to comment a little bit on you know, how you should think of using this integral. And you've seen how uh, powerful you know, already the Paris integration formula was. So here, you see, you're integrating over the over. And I said at first, well, let's assume the boundary is the crossings. But it doesn't matter. You can integrate even over a singular variety. You're integrating over smooth locus of a singular variety. So the integrals that you get, they don't depend on the compactification, right? So in other words, there are invariants under birational transformations with centers at the boundary. In other words, you get invariants of singularities this way. And things you've heard of in like, the minimal model program, things called the log terminal, Kavamata log terminal. So all of this is really about convergence of these integrals. They say some kind of uh, threshold or whatever has to be bigger than one, bigger equal than one. Well, the thresholds are exactly uh, these things, you know. So as you look at a smooth model where you look at the pullback, and you know, these are the kind of coefficients that show up here. So, uh, okay, now in the toric language, so let me make it more explicit in the toric language. So suppose now that you have a fan that is maybe not very smooth. In other words, we're calling toric parameter, but smooth. In other words, uh, in some cones, you can't, you don't get an integral, a part of an integral basis of the whole lattice. This means that you can't really write it directly as a product of geometric series. The number, the, the summation of your piecewise linear function uh, over that cone. But just think of this. You have a piecewise linear function on the cone, so it's linear on this cone. Well, you're summing over all integer points of the cone. So if you want to reduce it to a product of geometric series, you can subdivide so that then you get what you want. And of course, the answer is not going to depend on the subdivision because it's defined completely intrinsically in terms of the summation of the integral points in some cone. So, so this is a toric picture of these kind of integrals. Uh, so these are invariants that uh, encode information about singularities, and well, for our purposes, they play <coughs> an important role in finding projections, volume and so on. All right, so now I come to the actual topic of uh, this talk. 
So we want to understand how much arithmetic is important in geometry, how much geometry is arithmetic, and so on. Uh, and the kind of classical questions in high dimensional algebraic geometry are when is a variety irrational, irrational to projective space, when is a state irrational, is it becoming uh, rational after multiplication with uh, uh, some projective space, or unirational, in other words, dominated by projective space. Okay, so these are the three. Classes. And uh, there's been uh, a lot of work on these things in you know, algebraic geometry, then big breakthroughs in the 70s. Uh, Arthur Mumford, Mani Muskovsky, Clayton Griffiths. Examples of complex three folds, which are irrational, but not state irrational, or not rational. So that was uh, kind of important, but uh, uh, quite recently, there's been a lot of new work and a lot of progress uh, on the distinction uh, or the failure of stable rationality for some threefolds for which stable rationality was unknown. And so these developments rely on the theory of algebraic cycles, particularly zero cycles initially. Well, that showed that something called the integral decomposition of the diagonal uh, specializes as well in families with mildly singular special fibers. Dr. Rutka uh, introduced the notion of universal speech zero triviality, which they showed also specialized as well. So how should you think of this thing? Uh, all right. It's kind of an analog of rational connectedness. So it means that you can connect points by rational code, for example. And universal means you do it over every field extension of the ground field. Okay. So it's like a possibility of drawing rational curves, putting arbitrary points on the rational, something like this. But then it turned out that you don't need these zero cycles, you don't need the zero cycles at all. You can show directly that stable rationality specializes in uh, multi singular families. That was the work of Nikhil Schindler in 2017. So it came out, I remember, in the summer of 17. And then Maxime was visiting uh, New York for a week to see the deals. And we met on the first day of this visit uh, for lunch. And I said, well, there is this paper just appeared on the archive. And uh, so then that afternoon, we proved the theorem that, in fact, rationality specializes, not just stable rationality. So now, so I'll discuss these invariants a little bit uh, on the next slide. So the basis for this is the theorem of Larson and Lewis, to the effect that if you look at this very strange abelian group spanned, really, by classes of stable rational varieties. You consider algebraic varieties modulus stable rationality, and then you look at the three abelian group generated by those. So, okay. Then they showed that this is actually the same thing as the K0 of algebraic varieties, which you know as you know, scissor relations, x, y, x minus y, modulo the class of the affine line. So the proof is very short. It's essentially a one-page proof. The key technical ingredient in this proof was important technical ingredient, which is the deep factorization theorem by Abramovich. Rule, many people in both Sodachic, to the fact that if you have barational varieties, you can understand simple steps uh, realizing the barational correspondence. It's kind of a chain of blow ups and smooth centers. So that was the key in the proof of, and there is nothing else in the theory of Sars. You can look up the paper, there's really nothing else. So when I saw that paper and I saw the proof, I said, okay, very cute. But it must be useless because it's so general, it must be totally useless. It's not due to Hyonaka? Sorry? That uh, specializes is not due to Hyonaka? The deep factorization, no. So that's I not true. Hyonaka said that it was due to him. Maybe. But the other guys say it's due to them. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, the deep factorization, yeah. yeah. The resolution of singularities is due to Hyonaka, but uh, you don't know what you blow up. So these no, guys, no, he, 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 he claims it. Well, so maybe, so I don't know, but they keep relying on 
But anyway, when it came out, I guess it became apparent to people that it should be used for something that's kind of important technical result. So this was the first use, as far as I can tell, important use. And uh, again, so it's 2003. And uh, only 2017, uh, I think I realized that there is something called the motivic reduction formula, which is the same formula that I showed you before, where you replace the P by T. It's essentially the same formula. Namely, you're integrating over some open part of some variety, and the answer is the sum over the strata of the commodification. So why do I say it's essentially the same thing? You will see the formula in a second, but uh, this is what the motivic reduction formula actually is. So in the absolute case, you see we have some open part, and then we have some kind of commodification, and then we integrate over this. Now, if you look at this presentation here, it's the relative case where you take an integral model over the spectrum of a DVR, and you have some kind of special fiber, and the special fiber has some kind of components. And then you are saying that some kind of integral over the open part, if you like, is equal to some kind of expression in terms of boundary components. So this is what this motivic reduction formula is. All right, so now let me give you the formula, okay, maybe a little bit later. So what's uh, you know, the specific reduction formula was established by others, but what they realized is that if you take it as is, then you have a specialization from the K0 of varieties of the genetic fiber to K0 varieties of the special fiber. Well, and that means that you can try to understand the rationality of the the failure of rationality, the stable rationality of the generic fiber in terms of the failure of stable rationality of the special fiber. And why is it an advance? Because mildly singular special fibers sometimes pick up obstructions to stable rationality that you don't see in the generic fiber. Okay? For example, non trivial brow group can show up in a mildly singular special fiber of a family of varieties where the generic fiber has no brow group so, the only thing we did with Maxim is realize that if we instead look at the three abelian groups spent by uh, classes of rationality, of algebraic varieties, rather than stable rationality, then the same formula works. And why does it work? Because we understand exactly the steps in the equalization. Namely, if you look at the variety, you look at the blow up some focus, then what's the variational type of the exceptional divider? Or what can it be? The projectivization of a vector bundle, right? So it has to be the variational type of the base times the corresponding thing, the projective space. So that's the ingredient. So why do we call it burn site? So the burn site in dimension zero. So these are fields. It works, of course, our theory works characteristically the only because it relies on differentialization, that's not only characteristic, but so you take zero dimensional algebraic varieties. So these are fields over the ground field. Now field extensions correspond to Gallo the subgroups of the absolute Gallo up to conjugacy. Okay? Well subgroups of a group up to conjugacy, so that's kind of the burn side group of Group, so in dimension zero, it's really kind of the Burnside thing that we know from group theory. And this, this is why we call it Burnside in higher dimensions, because this was the analog of that. Uh, and so what's the formula? Okay, so we pick an integral model, uh, we look at the special fiber, we look at how the special fiber uh, can be expressed in terms of boundary components, they could be multiplicities. We ignore multiplicities. It turns out that the formula will work no matter what. And then the formula is the same from before, plus minus plus minus, of contributions from the boundary. So, okay, so that's it. Now, if you think the PIDIC integration type, well, we are integrating of all the open part, and the integral is not going to depend on what the completion is. So no matter which integral model you pick, this is going to be consistent. If you write down a correct formula, it's just going to be consistent as the blocks. It's going to be an invariant. 
And so, well, this is consistent by ideology, but you have to actually prove that it's consistent by looking explicitly, combinatorially, what uh, law still do for you. So, now, um, uh, I should say right away that this is not the only formula that you can write down. There are actually many formulas that would satisfy the condition that you're invariant under the law. Okay? So, that point I'll come back to a little bit later. Now, uh, I should say that these specialization methods, uh, already the one by Bozan and all these developments, uh, allow to make a very substantial breakthrough in uh, particular three dimensional geometry. So, the problem of stable rationality was essentially settled for all rationally connected three points, except uh, things by rational to cubic three points. That's still at all. But otherwise, if you have a uh, rational connected threefold that's not rational, so a very general member of that family is not going to be stable rational either. So this specialization thing allowed to produce families of smooth varieties where some fibers are not stable rational and some fibers are stable rational. Already in dimension three. In dimension four, we have examples where the non rational fibers are dense in the family. So, uh, many people try there as well. So, okay. So, when you do birational geometry, so the first thing you want to understand is birational maps with the break varieties. The next thing you would want to understand is suppose you have some groups acting, linear algebraic groups or finite groups to begin with, or Gamma groups. And suppose now you want to understand G equivariant birational geometry. Now, this is much harder because not only do you need to find this complicated thing, rational transformation, but you have to make sure that at every stage you can fix the linearization match, that one action is mapped to another action. So, okay. Now, therefore, from the beginning, I kind of wanted a version where we can take into, into account the G action and to have like a G equivalent burn cycle. Now, there is such thing called the G-equivariant case theory, K0, which is, from you know, this perspective, from my perspective, a fraud. Because what does it do? In addition to the standard axioms for K0, it requires the axiom that all G actions on linear spaces are trivial. But they're all trivial. They're all trivialized in this very strange equivariant K0. Now, just think of that. If you're coming from rational geometry, you've heard of Noether's problems, counterexamples. There are some subgroups, like order 32, so that if you look at the representation, you take a quotient, the quotient is not rational. It's completely clear that linear actions you know, encode a lot of rational information. If you trivialize all linear action, you're losing everything. In fact, that's a theorem, a recent theorem of Bogomolov and myself, that all unramified uh, rational invariants for varieties over forces of a finite field at V-bar are induced from quotients of the type linear representation by, the fi by a finite group. And in fact, the finite group is very straightforward. It's just a central extension of the dealing group. Okay? So all of rational invariants come from there. This version of equivariant K0, you're talking about still K0 variety. Yes, K0 oh, okay. variety. Of course, the topology is right. Yeah, okay. 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 Variety. Right. It's K0 variety. So, okay. So then you try to understand, well, what happens if you have a G group? A G action on these turn side groups. So, uh, all right. So and we said, okay, which, which groups are of interest? Like finite groups. Even cyclic groups. For example, <coughs> maybe you don't know, but uh, the classification of Zima two actions on P3 is still an open problem. Okay? It's a big open problem. The rational geometry in dimension three to understand the different actions of Zima two on P3. Okay? There are examples of actions, list of examples, but then it's unknown whether the examples are actually disjoint and they're describing different classes of actions. 
And why is that? Because for one action is presented like this, another action like that. Well, how do you know there is a chain of blowups? I mean, it's, it's difficult if you want to do it explicitly. So, therefore, finding obstructions to like G equivariant for rationality is sort of an interesting thing. And so let's look at some variety with a birational G action. After blowing up a problem, we can assume that the action is regular. And then the fixed point locus is a disjoint union of components, some loci, fixed point loci. Now, for each of those, we can keep track of its birational type, but also a collection of weights in the normal bundle. Okay? So let's be explicit. Look at this action on P2, where we multiply the coordinates by some nth roots of 1, with weights ABC. There are three fixed points, and ABC are what you will. So the fixed points, you know, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and the weights are like this. Right? Now, so I write here for a point. These are different points, but they're you know, points. Now, it is known that linear actions on projective spaces, dimension bigger than one, are all birational or equivalent, equivalent. Now, how do you realize this? Already in the case of P2, it's a huge headache. It's essentially, uh, um, it's. So it means that these kind of expressions here, if you forget the points, Satisfy all kinds of relations if you want this to be an invariant. So there are no trivial relations that are going to come out. And, uh, well, uh, I'm going to define, you know, some symbols and relations uh, so that uh, when I look at this assignment, take a variety and map it to, let's say, the variational type of the stratum together with the set of and maybe forgetting even the variational stratum, just keeping track of this vector of weights, that uh, what we get is going to be a, a variational variant. So you look at G equivariant blow ups, and the both relations that after you compute these things you know, on the blow up and subtract the thing from the, down there, you get zero. So that's a condition. So, okay, now suppose your variety has, like, your action has no fixed points. Well, then you don't see anything. So you look at translation action of torsion on the variety, you don't see anything. Well, sometimes you see something. So it's in those cases that you get invariants. So you introduce the following group. It's going to be spent by symbols, E1, E, N. N is the dimension of the variety. Okay? Uh, there's the AI, R in the dual to our. A villain group G, uh, subject to relations that, uh, first of all, when we look at the weights in the tangent bundle, we don't really know which weight is first, which weight is second, therefore, it has to be a set invariant. And secondly, there is kind of a strange relation that will simplify in a second that if you look at A1 A up to AK, B1 up to BN minus K, then you can write it as a sum, there are indices, you know, there are some indices. Don't worry about it. You'll see much easier things in a second. So this is the group B and G, birational types uh, for G, for the G action. And so the statement is that uh, if you compute the class of your variety of the G action, this value of this group G, then it's a well-defined G equivariant birational there. OK. Now, there are closely related groups where the last, the first property is the same, the ascending covariance. So the, the second property, you see the summation has changed a little bit. Two slides ago, the summation was like this. On this slide, the summation is like that. So it's called a uh, motivic type, MN of G. And for various reasons, it's a better thing to look at. We'll see in a second. And now I'm going to make it even more straightforward, where the only relation concerns the first two letters and not the others. Now, if you look at this relation, you have to admit that it begins to look like K-theory, except that K-theory is like x, 1 minus x, 
and here we have a b minus a plus a minus b b and everything else stays what it is so it turns out that this relation implies the previous relation the bit more complicated one uh, and the previous is related to the birational types as follows so the birational types have square brackets the model types have angle brackets so if the symbols are all not zero, if the case, the weights are all not zero, you do nothing. If one of the weights is zero, you put a two. And if uh, two of the weights or more are zero, you put a zero. So you get some kind of map. So theorem is that this is a well-defined homomorphism from the rational types to modular types, and one of the two torsion is kind of subjective. You could already see this kind of a two in the picture. So I'll show you in specific examples I mentioned two. All right, the B1 is simply uh, Z mod N, okay? Uh, multiplicative, because uh, we have the condition that A, B, and A, N have to be equal prime. So the B2 type, the thing relevant to mention two. So let's look at Z mod P. So then we're looking at the symbols, A1, A2, uh, GCD A1, A2, P equals 1, so not both 0, not P, and symmetric, and then there is this condition, and then there is this condition. Now, the modular type looks just like this. The only difference, again, is that AA is A0, and here AA is 2A0. That's it. So, B2 and M2 are essentially the same. So, uh, we wanted to understand specialization for these equivariant things. So we looked at what's the universal thing that will describe G actions. So that's the universal thing that will describe G action. And then we started looking, but wait a minute. There are so many equations describing uh, these groups. Like here, for example, well, symmetry and then these kind of equations. So we have variables running from like 1 to P. Well, symmetric, so p over 2, and essentially as many equations. Why should there be any solutions at all? I mean, once we start holding these kind of equations, maybe there simply aren't any non-zero things. So you can interpret this as a system of linear equations on a vector space spent by symbols, and now you need to compute dimensions of these vector spaces. So Maxim and I started computing last December, uh, and uh, we look at the dimension, the Q rank of that vector space, and what we get is uh, P squared plus 23 or 24. Now, so 24, the relations, you know, A, B, B, A, so you can see as two acting. You can see one over two, maybe one over four. Where does the three come from? So, I mean, Okay, the first couple of things you compute it by hand, and you put it on a computer, and then you see this. All right. Now, for n bigger equal than 3, it's much worse. The systems are overdetermined. There are way too many equations. And so, then by computer, we were finding p minus 5 times p minus 7 over 24. For all primes up to 41. And then suddenly at 43, there is a jump by 1. And then again at 59. And then again at 67. What does it mean? So then got into computing. So uh, looking, for example, at uh, the L part. So as I said, it's a Z modules a priori. You can look at these as vector spaces over Q or vector spaces over finite fields. And you can try to compute those ranks over different finite fields. I mean, you anticipate that there are all kinds of issues when you reduce mod 2 because there was always this 2 in the picture. But no, there are all kinds of issues for primes dividing p plus minus 1. You're seeing some very strange jumps numerically. Again, at the primes that you've seen before, but also at other primes, and the jumps are you know, bigger and bigger. And so here, for example, for b equals 4, for n equals 4, b4, it's a dimension 4. So this is the behavior, the jumping of the two torsion part compared to the uh, sink over Q. So here, for example, the Q rank over Q, 48 is 7, 
uh, on top of what you expect, on top of the p minus 5 times p minus 7 over 24, and here is 49, and so on and so on. So here, the physicist uh, is still got into the picture, because it turned out things like this or similar things dimension 2 show up in some kind of partition function uh, on C2 modular finite loop. So they've seen things like A comma B equals A B minus A and so on and so on. We have no idea. Picasso was giving a talk on that at IGS in January, and Maxim was the audience said, wait, we have it in all dimensions. This is what it is. And so in particular, so uh, there is some kind of modified group that you can introduce, namely uh, impose anti-reflection, where the first uh, letter gets multiplied by minus one, and then you put a minus sign here. So this is a subgroup in the big group, right? It's the things. That... And then it turned out that there is actually an objective homomorphism of product on these groups, right? So that's a very strong thing. It's a complicated formula symmetrization, da -da 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 -da, discovered numerically at first. But what it means, in particular, well, there is also a version where there is no a in here, and a times m goes in there. And in particular, uh, you can embed the anti-symmetric, the, the ones that are stable under the same, into the n plus first one. And you can find non-zero elements <coughs> in all dimensions. So in particular, you find that the dimension of the m, n, a, for z mod 3 to the n z action is at least one. In fact, numerically, this is the first non-zero element in every dimension. For well, the first non-zero element, and how was it discovered? You go to dimension 5, 81, 3, 27, 9, 3, okay, well, and all the others are zero. So, and if you look at, let's say, this F2 coefficient, then the first non-trivial thing, numerically again, and theoretically, uh, dimension at least one is uh, for z mod 2 to the m action of the parachute. Now, so now we understand that there is this multiplication, that you can propagate classes from low dimension into higher dimension. And you can ask the question, well, do we get everything? So you can look at the primitive ones in every dimension. These are those that don't come from the previous ones. So what happens to the primitive ones? Okay, what's the dimension of the primitive things? Well, in dimension one, this is the Euler function over two, right? That's p minus one over two. Uh, in dimension two, it's the genus of the modular curve x one of n, if you look at z mod n actions. In dimension three, uh, well, so the primitive ones, they are like this. Numerically, you keep accumulating those. So you have jumps, for example, 54, or here, 3, 7. Now, again, let me point out what's being done here numerically. So we're looking at matrices uh, of size 200 to the 3. And in dimension 4, it's going to be 200 to the 4. And they're computing ranks of such matrices. Okay? So in particular, for some of those experiments, it took a knife to even create the matrix. So and then, again, hours to compute the train. So it turns out that numerically, for n up to 242, which is 200 to the fours, matrix, we find no primitives so far. However, it was kind of similar in dimension three in that at first there is nothing. The first non-trivial one, the jump is at 43. And then again, it's very slow, but then it begins to grow. So maybe we just haven't reached the numbers that we need to reach to pick up uh, new primitive elements in dimension 4. And there is nothing in dimension 5 either. In dimension 5, this is very hard to understand. So it turns out that so, uh, there are symbols in, yeah, money symbols, modular symbols in the theory of uh, modular curves. And again, uh, they're kind of similar, but not quite. So our symbols are symmetric. These symbols are not at all symmetric. Our symbols satisfy, you know, a b equals a minus b b plus a b minus a. These symbols satisfy, you know, a different thing. So, like the one thing that we observe 
like theoretically, you know that the dimension of uh, of a cast forms is this number, and this number is kind of awfully similar, awfully close to the numbers that we were getting numerically computed the dimensions of these spaces. So we have been looking for a link, and so it turned out that on these modular symbols there is some kind of involution. You look at the plus eigenspace, and then uh, it turned out that this is exactly the primitive thing, and this is how we can match uh, dimensions uh, here and there. Uh, so this is how we know that uh, the dimension of this is the genus of the model for x1 and n. Now, uh, I told you in the previous chapter on the hack operators. So, so why did we want these modular symbols rather than rational symbols? So it turns out that modular symbols, they have another neat presentation. Namely, uh, you look at uh, mm, lattices, z to the n, and you look at uh, simplicial cones in those lattices, very similar to the theory of toric varieties. And now uh, we assume that the cone is spent by a basis of the lattice. And now uh, for each such equation, Think equivalence class of triples. This is a cone. This chi is uh, an element in L tensor A. A is the dual of the group, right? Uh, you can associate an element in this modular group as follows. We choose a basis of L spanning our cone and express in this basis our element. You know, it's a basis element tensor something here. And then the image of this thing in the modular group is simply the collection of weights here. Now just from the definition, it's clear that this is adic equivalent. Now what about that second property, the modular property? Well, it translates into uh, nothing but scissor relations. You look at the simplicial cone, and you subdivide it into simplicial subcones. Every time, make sure that they're basic simplicial subcones, in other words, spanned by a basis of L. And then uh, the modular relation that we've seen before is simply the relation that uh, you know this is equal to that. And in terms of coming back to the theory of historic varieties, you should think of this invariant as some kind of summation of a lattice point, some kind of integral. In other words, the way these invariants were cooked up. They're supposed to be invariant under blow-ups. I guess we're saying that every blow-up is locally like a toric blow-up or something like this. And so all the toric relations matter. But once you have a presentation like this, in terms of lattices and cones, it's clear that you can introduce hacky operators. You just average with symbols over, over lattices. And then, OK, uh, you find that you know, well-defined contribute. Then, there is an example of a hack operator, and here is a spectrum of a hack operator T2 on M2 Z mod 59. And if you see something very special here, right? So what could it be? Einstein series. So, uh, and what's the rest? Well, the rest, it's uh, the other stuff. And uh, in particular, we can match some of those to uh, uh, Modular forms uh, for gamma one p to n, but the primitive ones we don't know how to match to other things. So we are finding primitive things that we should think of as kind of new motives because well, just few vector spaces uh, together with a huge you know, algebra of commuting operators, hack operators, and uh, you, you can compute eigenvalues. They seem to lie in the circles. I mean, it's all. So nice. So, uh, so what happened to summarize? So we constructed some groups related to these birational types, the modular types. They have hack op operators. You can also think of non-abelian versions and versions with stabilizers. What was mentioned in the previous talk is that it's very tricky to integrate if your strata start having stabilizers, right? And so then. Uh, you have to keep track of uh, stabilizers, the action in the tangent space, and anyway, but you can. And so this 
gives rise to refined J-covariant variance invariants, which should be used. But what's kind of striking to me, and that I want to emphasize uh, last, is that there's this really unexpected connection between a high dimensional Cremona group, group of variation transformations, even of Pn, and of more forms or homology of arithmetic groups. Thank you. Any questions? Is there any topological counterpart of this invariance? Sorry? It's topological, purely topological. Well, uh, is there a topological thing in here? So I, I don't know. I, what we did realize, so that even for trivial uh, actions, at least you get the number of connected components or something like that. So. But uh, um, This, you just view this algebraic geometrically. But it's possible that you can even well, how about kind of symplectic. You can look at rates. You can talk about symplectic yeah. by right Yes, yeah. yeah. symplectic by rational geometry, that should not be applicable as well. As long as you can reduce, I mean, I don't know what deep factorization means symplectically, but uh, blowing up smooth things yeah. and, and keeping track of the weights, you can do that. And then you get some invariants and uh, Yeah, yeah. So people are asking. Can you take G equals GM? You can take GM. You can take Tora, yes. You can take, uh, it's not as interesting okay. because, uh, but for GA, it's interesting. For example, you don't see weights in the tangent space, but you could imagine see looking deeper than the tangent space. So your G now is a finite group? Here, so we focused on finite groups already, but you don't need finite groups at all. And you don't need the billion. So instead of looking at the weights, you just look at representations. So your things are, and again, there are different versions. You can forget the parational type of the locus, the fixed point locus, or you can keep track of the parational type of the fixed point locus. And you have stabilizers, so you have to keep track of that divided by the, you know, by the stabilizer. Right? And then the connection to modular form in your slides so this is just matching symbols. I have no idea where and how the modular forms will come. Will come but G was connected to the, to the level of the modular form in your example. Exactly. Z -mod Z -mod Z -mod Z -mod diagonal, just cyclic group action, Z mod N gives you X. Gamma one of X. Gamma one. Yeah, gamma one of X. Gamma one of X. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I really don't know. So. But for more general, G is now. Well, we looked at the Vedan groups here. Yes, for non appealing so groups, again, it would be in the representation. Well, but I hope that G equals GM would give you something like Jacobi forms, except if you follow the guess, it would just be way too Jacobi forms, so that that's not that interesting. But maybe G equals GM times an extra cyclic group would be higher level Jacobi forms, something like this. So, uh, okay, so GM, uh, I guess if it's just a GM, GM action on a high dimensional variety, you may be able to get some information out of this. But if it's a toric variety, you see all torus sections are the same, with only one maximal torus. Anyway, so that uh, uh, won't help. And um, the connection between toric varieties themselves and these modular forms, that is part of Boris of Gunnels' first work. We are in the schedule of the Okay. Yeah, what's the disconnection between Cremona and uh, automorphic form? Well, so as I explained, you look at finite subgroups of the Cremona group, uh -huh. you write down the parational invariant, parational BN of G. Let's say the group is a billion. Not normal or not normal? Uh, sorry? Normal or not normal? You just find it a billion group. group. Find it a billion group. Act even on parational variety. Yeah. Okay, for example, protect the space. Non-linearly, in the case of Pn, then you can attach to this action an element in this group Bn of G. Bn of G is homomorphism of this group Mn of G. Mn of G resides in the world of homomorphic forms. It carries Hecker operators. Um, it's uh, in dimension two and three, directly connected to the model occur x1 of n. In higher dimensions, <coughs> there, is some piece of the, some, there are some pieces that come from dimension 2 and 3. And then there are some other pieces that show up numerically 
that you don't have an interpretation for. So that's one line. And so the commodities come up as birational G invariants? The group B and G is a birational, uh, it's a universal birational G invariant. And then we'll be more serious to the fact that these things specialize and so on and so forth. All right? Anything else? Any questions? I just wonder, so what about non compact discrete group G? Can that be? Sorry, what? Can that be non compact discrete group? Uh, discrete group? Um, hmm. I mean, it's very hard, yeah, it's very hard to do it on the right geometrically. Maybe there should be more variety, but maybe people know how to, uh, how to think about it. But, uh, so no, here we want to extract, I mean, invariants from the action of the tangent pump, discrete groups. What can we talk about? If no further questions, let's thank Professor Shinko again. So I think there is lunch in steps. Or my guess is. <laughs> <laughs> is that a routine? <laughs> <laughs>